The Tom Woods Show, episode 2312. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Come on now, folks. If you ain't going to start that side hustle now, then when? Check out my free ebook, Five Paths to an Online Income, where I take you step by step through five things that I do that keep food on the Woods household table and how you can do them too. Check it out at pathstoincome.com. Hey, everybody. Tom Woods here. Delighted to have Robert Barnes back with us again. Obviously, we have to talk about the Trump indictment. Everybody's talking about that right now. I got to know Robert Barnes because I appeared on the Viva Barnes extravaganza. I listen to you guys all the time because I always want to know what you guys think about what's going on in the news. I feel like I can get a grounding in it if I start by knowing where you guys stand. So, Robert, welcome back. Glad to be here. All right, look, let's get right down to it. I'm even reading Joe Walsh, who is as anti-Trump as they come, saying this indictment is weak. It's obviously political. I think on balance, it's liable to help Trump. So you even see some severe critics of Trump saying this is a whole lot of BS. So I trust, especially following your Twitter feed, that that is your opinion as well. It's one of the weakest indictments ever brought. And what's extraordinary is that this is why we decided to cross the Rubicon of indicting former presidents, indicting the leading opponent of the existing political administration, is this case. Of all the cases to do it, I mean, if you're going to try to cross that Rubicon, it better be, you know, you're running a massive criminal gang, murder, rape, something extreme, not... We're going to dispute whether or not the book entry on an internal corporate ledger consistently disclosed the details of a non-disclosure agreement that required you not disclose it, and whether the victim of extortion listed that he'd been the victim of extortion on his internal business records. It's absurd. No one can find an analogous case in the history of New York or in, in anywhere in America. Nobody can find another case. And put aside this being the leading opponent of the existing administration, Put aside this being the former president of the United States, no one can find anybody who was ever prosecuted on charges like this. They can't find one single analogous case in the nation. That's how outrageous and ridiculous this case is. Well, what specifically is it that they're accusing him of? And is this thing they're accusing him of, does it, I mean, I guess it's kind of implied in your previous answer, does it rise to the level of a felony? Well, it's kind of a shell game. It's a New York City style shell game in terms of what they're actually accusing him of, because the indictment itself doesn't explain how it violates any other crime. They say that he conspired to commit another crime, but they don't tell him or anyone else what the other crime is to try to elevate this to not only to elevate this to a felony, but to even charge as a misdemeanor for those people out there that may wonder, hold on a second, New York can prosecute me for what I put in my own books. The answer is no. In fact, even the misdemeanor law itself requires that you make a false entry in a book or ledger with the intent to defraud somebody else. So it's only the intent to defraud that has made a crime when it's combined with a fraudulent act. So that's why you're keeping your internal books won't constitute a act of defraud unless you're planning on sharing that information with someone else. Like, for example, they're thinking here of an accounting firm doing an audit or a government agency doing an audit. Uh, of course, that isn't present here. They don't allege that ever happened or that this had any impact on it. So you read the statement of facts, which is a separate statement. It's not a legal filing. They've actually taken it down from the DA's office today. It was publicly available. Now it's not. And it's clear what they're really doing is they want to change strategies as they go along. They're like, well, maybe Trump did it to violate election laws. So we'll say maybe that's the other crime. But in case we're wrong, maybe somehow it impacted taxes. So we'll say that's the other. They can't even decide what the other crime is. That's how nebulous this prosecution is. So presumably the original assumption was that this somehow violated federal campaign finance laws, that Trump made a false entry in his own internal books. Like people say, what are the 34 charges? It's the same charge, charged 34 times. And as Professor Jonathan Turley put it, 34 times zero is still a big fat zero. But that's all they've done is they've said that the payment to Stormy Daniels by Michael Cohen that was then reimbursed 
that was then listed as a legal expense on the internal records and books of Trump's trust and businesses was somehow a false entry with the intention to defraud, we don't know who, by purportedly violating some other law, such as a federal election laws, though they don't clarify that either. Now, the problem is, how could Trump have been trying to influence an election by an entry he made in 2017? How was he trying to influence the 2016 election? Basic contradiction there in the facts. But to give people some broader context, the scary part about this is not just the weaponization of the criminal justice process against a former president, which means they'll do it against anybody, but it's the attempts to misuse and abuse campaign finance laws to punish dissident speech and dissident candidates. It's where I've often disagreed with my friends on the left. I'm not a fan of campaign finance laws. It's like one of those ones that you and Michael Malice do about how a law really gets made, right? Instead of the third grade version we're taught in civics books. Yeah. Is that the campaign finance laws are almost always going to be used not to harass the powerful, but to harass the people without power, not to harass the privileged, not to limit the power of the privileged, but in fact, to help the powerful punish the unprivileged. And the campaign finance laws, it says that if you give anything of value, then you have to disclose it to a campaign. But it says it's for the purpose, for the purpose of influencing a campaign. And the reason why that's significant is that, oh, we all do things of value that benefit campaigns every year. You know, I mean, you do it. I do it. Every American that does anything that talks to somebody else, that loans their labor, that loans their time, that lends it effectively or by implication on social media or participation in the court of public opinion. Everybody does something like that. Nobody calls that a donation, a secret donation. But that's what they're trying to do here. So what the law is and what the Supreme Court has said is the First Amendment protects the right to spend as much money as you want on your own campaign, the right of due process, of fair notice, the right of the rule of lenity in criminal cases that limits the scope and scale of criminal charges to only be what someone could have fair notice they could be charged with a crime for. All of that requires that we limit the interpretation of the campaign finance laws so that when we see something that says the purpose has to be to influence a campaign, that means it has to be the exclusive, the only, the sole purpose in order for that law to be constitutional. So here the problem is, and this is why they don't even formally allege it in the indictment because they know it might fall apart, is they're trying to say that the purpose of Michael Cohen paying Stormy Daniels was to influence the election and it had no other purpose whatsoever had no other purpose for legal services, no other purpose to help Trump's reputation, no other commercial purpose to possibly protect the brand of Trump, which is the main business value he had. Nothing personal, not just to protect his wife, to protect his children, to protect his reputation with them. That that couldn't even possibly be a motivation for the Stormy Daniels payment. And then secondly, that his entry into the ledger also could have only been to somehow retroactively influence the 2016 election. So they have factual problems and they have constitutional problems and they have legal problems with that theory. So that's why they chose not to put that explicitly in the indictment. And what they're doing is they're leaving themselves open to be able to change it. They're just going to change like a whack-a-mole trying to guess what law it is they're charging you with a crime with. Well, maybe it was to not allow Michael Cohen to fully have to pay the tax that would otherwise be due on that payment or something like that. They're keeping their doors open so they can constantly change the theory of the case, which, by the way, violates Trump's rights under the grand jury clause of both the New York and the United States Constitution. Well, I guess the reason that it's so convoluted is that the purpose of it is not to vindicate justice or whatever. No, I mean, first of all, this campaign finance stuff has nothing to do with real justice anyway. It's all just bureaucratic rules, but it's obviously just to get Trump. Everybody knows that. I don't think anybody's really seriously trying to hide that. We all know that's what they're saying in private. Some of them are probably saying it in public. And so it's part of this whole legal trend whereby the law is not here to be an impartial arbiter. It's here to be used as a weapon. And just like the Bolsheviks did, the Bolsheviks view was that we don't need all these bourgeois precedents. What matters is as long as the judge has a revolutionary consciousness and advances the revolution, that's what we need. And it's the same. I did an episode just about a week or so ago about what happened at Stanford with Judge Duncan getting shouted down. Then the dean goes up and it's one of these fake DEI deans, dean in quotation marks, basically supporting the students and scolding the judge and saying, yes, in effect, 
it's acceptable for students to stand there and yell and scream because somebody they disagree with, somebody they perceive as an enemy is there. When these people become lawyers, we have a scary future ahead. Now, by the way, I don't know if you heard about, I can't think of his name now, but a fairly flamboyant, not in a homosexual sense, but uh, lawyer has told Stanford that he's filing a complaint with the bar to urge them not to admit these students to the bar because of their behavior. I don't know if you heard about that. I have not. Now, my own view is I'm against licensing boards, period. So I'm never a fan of the bar or bar complaints because I don't think the bar should exist. What happens when we allow the small professional class cadre of people to monopolize gatekeeping control over access to occupations and professions is it will inevitably be used and misused and abused to target dissidents. I agree completely with that. I agree completely with that. It's just that because it's been used that way so far, you have to understand why somebody takes a visceral joy in seeing it turned on the bad guys every now and then. Oh, no doubt. I mean, I think my friend Mike Davis, the lawyer, made a good point when he's talking about Republicans returning the favor in terms of prosecutions. He said, look, he goes, two wrongs doesn't make a right, but it does make it even. Yes. So I understand that entirely. But I think you're right. The best analogy I've been trying to give to people for the last half decade to understand the mindset of the new left is don't think 1960s, don't think free speech movement at Berkeley, don't think classic liberals, don't think Robert Kennedy Jr., don't think any Kennedy, frankly. Think instead old school 1930s communist activists. These are ends justified the means people, and that means any means whatsoever. That's the mindset. That's the mentality. There was a recent show called Carnival Row, which actually did this whole second season on this revolution they called the New Dawn Movement. And it was kind of brilliant because basically it was clearly a communist movement. And it showed its rhetorical appeal and its ugly reality at the same time. Rare for Hollywood to make something that would actually portray something like that, honestly. But that's the mindset we have to go back to. These are people who believe in show trials. They believe the point and purpose of a trial is the show part of the trial, not the factual merits, not the legal substance, not the constitutional respect. No, that means anything to them. Those are all tools. They have no inherent value. And that's why these leftist prosecutors think the way they do. Leftist judges think the way they do. Leftist politicians think the way they do. You look at this indictment. Like some people are saying, well, you can clearly indict a former president. And I'm not sure where that comes from, because our Constitution actually, in my view, answers that question, because it does talk about when you can indict a former president. And it's in the same clause that talks about removing them from federal office. And it says upon impeachment and upon conviction, which, by the way, by definition, when you've now convicted the president, he's now a former president, then you can indict, try, convict, and punish him in criminal court and remove him from federal office. But only then. The preconditions are impeachment and conviction in the Senate. You can see why our founders did it this way. They understood if any local prosecutor could weaponize their offices to remove a political opponent that was popular throughout the country and that was elected constitutionally to the presidency, then we've completely undermined the executive power being vested in the elected president of the United States through the Electoral College. So that's why they said state prosecutors don't have this authority. And instead, it has to go first through the elected branch of the United States federal government, and it has to go through both branches, and it has to get two-thirds approval for conviction in the Senate. So this was designed that if we really, some people said, well, clearly we have to be able to have this power. Otherwise, you could have former presidents going out and just doing mass murder. It's like, no, that's what impeachment is for. If you really have a morally horrendous act taking place that is not politically motivated, then the House will impeach, the Senate will convict, and then they can be indicted, tried, and sentenced. But only then, because there's too much danger in giving local prosecutors power than giving broad immunity to presidents in that context. And so the first problem with this indictment is, in my view, it does not come after impeachment and conviction. Trump was actually acquitted not once but twice in the Senate on bogus impeachment charges. This was known to the House and the Senate, these allegations right here. At the time, both of those impeachment proceedings went forward, and their failure to include it, even in impeachment grounds, is arguably a form of subjecting Trump now to double jeopardy. 
The Southern District of New York looked at these precise charges and said there was no basis to pursue them. And this is the Southern District of New York, which is the one of the most political in the country. Their neighboring Eastern District of New York just convicted a guy and is trying to send him to prison for putting out a meme, an actual meme that harmed nobody. They couldn't even prove it. That's how political these federal courts are in New York and federal prosecutors are in New York. And yet even they said you can't prosecute Trump for the Stormy Daniels issue. And the Federal Elections Commission, which is happy to politically make up the rules as they go along to punish people they don't like, they admitted and acknowledged that Trump did nothing wrong under the election laws under these provisions. And the reason is simple. Michael Cohen made this payment as legal services to protect Trump's reputation with his wife. It had nothing to do, frankly, with the campaign. The campaign was just the timing for Stormy Daniels to maximize her extortion threat with her extortion pals. Just a reminder for everybody, Stormy Daniels' most recent lawyer, Michael Avenatti, is in federal prison for doing what? Extortion, in the case of Nike. Now, he committed about a half dozen other crimes along the way. But you know, it's amazing that the victim of extortion is being indicted for being the victim of extortion. But the campaign was her timing and her leverage, but it was not the reason why any of this was ever paid. This was paid because Cohen decided to do it on his own accord by his own acknowledgement and mission. Now, he'll keep changing his testimony as it fits and serves and suits the people who could put him in prison for life for all the other crimes he committed. Another problem with this case is they have no reliable, trustworthy witness to put in front of the jury since it's Michael Cohen, the admitted perjurer, the admitted liar, the admitted fraudster, the admitted felon who's their entire testimony, who's going up there and contradicting what he publicly said previously. And what he publicly said previously is he did this for reasons independent of the campaign. Then the Southern District of New York came in and said, well, if you agree you really did this for the purpose of the campaign, we'll let you walk on all your tax charges and this will embarrass Trump. But legally, if Cohen made an illegal contribution to Trump, then Trump can't be responsible for that contribution. Because here's the problem they have in the New York case. They're trying to say in the indictment that the reason why Cohen made the payment in the first place was, first of all, solely for the purpose of influencing an election. That's problem one. That's clearly false. But secondly, they're saying Trump is the one who ordered the payment be made, and that is evidenced by Trump repaying it. Well, here they have another problem. There is no campaign finance violation in you spending your own money to influence an election. You can spend as much money as you want to influence your own election. That's what Citizens United is all about. You have a First Amendment right to spend all the money you want. Indeed, the Supreme Court has been clear, going back to the Buckley case, that campaign finance laws are constitutionally limited because of the First Amendment implications of those laws on speech, press, the right to petition the government, right of free association. So consequently, they've said that the only laws Congress can pass limiting campaign finance are to limit quid pro quo corruption by imposing limits on what third parties can give and disclosure requirements, but that there can be no limits whatsoever on what Trump or anyone else can give for their own campaign. So if Trump was telling Cohen, I think this is about the election, please pay this money and I'll pay you back. You're going to be my conduit. Well, there's no crime there. There's nothing illegal about that. Trump can spend all the money he wants to influence an election. Yet that's what the indictment alleges at the very top of the indictment. It alleges something that's not a crime under either federal law or state law. Because there's no intent to defraud. The intent to defraud argument is that somehow it was intended to defraud the election integrity system. Now, there's problems with that. It goes to honest services and this nonsense that even the Supreme Court has been slowly, steadily limiting the attempts to just criminalize disagreement with the government effectively. But putting that aside, there is no crime. There's no intent to defraud. There is no federal law violation for spending your own money. That's why they don't have a case at all. That's why they're keeping it flexible so they can keep changing their legal theory as they go along. Because as you're right, at the end of the day, this is what everybody knows it is. It's just about to get Trump to quote Dershowitz's recent book. Well, if that's the case, then what hope is there for Trump to be treated fairly by the legal system? I mean, what can you tell us about the judge involved, for example? Yeah, so, I mean, well, what's amazing is this judge was assigned to previous Trump proceedings, Trump organization cases, et cetera. There's no chance that he got randomly assigned this case. It's you supposed to be under New York law. But my guess is there's a trick within a system that people, the government loves to use. They did this actually in the Roger Stone case. That what they do is they tell the court system, we have a quote unquote related case. And 
in a related case is supposed to be, let's say I sue Tyson Foods for violating various vaccine laws. And then I bring another suit on the same issue against Tyson Foods that's already pending before another judge. In that circumstance, I could say it's a related case if I think it is so factually and legally intertwined that it makes sense for the same judge to have it. But they've long been concerned that lawyers will go judge shopping that way. So that's why you're not supposed to use a related case unless it's so intertwined that it makes no sense for any other judge to handle it. So clearly this indictment against Trump has nothing to do with those Trump organization issues. Stormy Daniels wasn't part of any of those cases. So listing it as a related case is the prosecutor abusing the related case rules to manipulate judicial assignment. So you have to ask yourself, why did the prosecutor want to handpick this particular judge? Well, it's because this judge is a longtime Democrat. It's because this judge bashed the Trump organization and took personal pot shots at him throughout those proceedings. And as was publicly disclosed in the press, this judge is so deeply intertwined with the Democratic political machine that his daughter was a key Kamala Harris campaign worker and volunteer and advisor. And it's like, this is exactly who should not be involved in this case. It's someone with these kind of deep political ties to the Biden-Harris administration. Now, you get a sense for how the system operates because Donald Trump Jr. and Eric Trump simply link an article that talks about the deep family ties between this judge and the Biden-Harris administration going all the way back to his daughter's political campaign involvement. And what happens? Former federal prosecutors who are aligned with the Democrats and members of the press start to attack Donald Trump Jr. and attack Eric Trump. First, they lie. They say, oh, they're sharing the personal photo of the daughter of the judge, and they put no other context. No, that's true. What they linked was an article. The article within the article showed photographic proof of her political ties to the Harris campaign and the fact that she was the judge's daughter, that it wasn't just made up. And what these people are doing in the media, people like Glenn Kessler, people like Joyce Aline, these other folks, is they're trying to intimidate anybody from questioning the corruption of the system. And they've done this to Trump and Trump supporters all along. Anytime anybody said, hold on a second, this looks like corruption. This witness is corrupt. This grand jury four person like the nut in Atlanta is corrupt. An actual living witch. He can't make this stuff up these days. Trump called it a witch hunt. Well, it turned out the witches were leading the hunt, literally. But anytime anybody did that, they criticized the grand jury four person in the Roger Stone case. What you saw from the media, what you saw from the liberal legal establishment was they were going to label that obstruction of justice. They were going to accuse you of a crime, intimidation of a witness, bribery somehow, all of which is nonsense. If you try to expose what they're doing, they're trying to obstruct justice. They're trying to intimidate witnesses. Then you get a confession through projection filter that uniquely explains what they're doing. So as you dig in, what you're seeing is that the system will go to great lengths to not allow people to publicly discuss or disclose the corruption of the system. The judge made that implicit threat to Trump. He didn't issue a gag order. That would have been unconstitutional. It would have unraveled the case early on because higher courts would have likely got involved and set the whole thing aside. So he was politically savvy enough to not issue a gag order, knowing that's what would happen. But he threatened Trump from the bench by saying, you better not do this and you better not do this. That's not within his power. The right to bail the right to secure someone's appearance at trial does not give a judge the right to suppress and censor speech. It doesn't give him the right to lecture him about what he can and cannot say. That is not within the constitutional power of bail. That's an unconstitutional condition on bail. And yet the judge was effectively doing that because that's who he is. So you have a politically motivated judge who is highly unlikely to give any impartial justice to Trump when he's got grounds to dismiss the case because indicting him violates the Constitution and the impeachment clause. This indictment violates the selective prosecution principles under the First Amendment, which says you cannot target someone for political reasons. That is a misuse of the prosecutorial process and requires dismissal as its remedy. Violates the due process clause of the 14th Amendment because there is no fair notice that you paid someone for legal services, which is in fact exactly what happened, could somehow be considered a crime in New York, that supporting your own campaign could somehow be considered a crime in New York. No one had fair notice of that. That violates your rights of due process. You can't criminally prosecute or punish someone under the rule of lenity and the requirements of fair notice under the due process clause. So he has grounds to dismiss on those grounds. 
likely has additional grounds to dismiss for violating the grand jury rules because it's almost guaranteed that the prosecutor lied to the grand jury about the state of the law, which is, in fact, grounds to dismiss and likely suborn perjured testimony from Michael Cohen to that same grand jury. That's also grounds to dismiss. They can hide exculpatory evidence thanks to the U.S. Supreme Court, unfortunately, but they can't do those other things to the grand jury. He has grounds to dismiss because it clearly violates on its face the statute of limitations. The last crime they allege took place was in the fall of 2017. The statute of limitations for this very crime is five years. That means they had to bring it by 2022. They didn't. That's why people resigned last year from the New York DA's office that wanted the case to progress is they knew it was over when the case wasn't brought. Instead, they're going to try to pretend that Trump was magically unavailable because he was in the White House. Well, they, they indicted Trump when he wasn't in the state. So that's a nonsense argument, nonsense interpretation. Statute of limitations also compels dismissal. And then he has moot grounds to stay the case on grounds that there's an upcoming election and that this case should not interfere with that election for constitutional principles. He has a right to transfer venue because he cannot get an impartial jury in Manhattan. Send it over to Staten Island where he could get an impartial jury, where you have a pretty split electorate. He has rights to all of those issues, but this judge is unlikely to grant him any of them because of political prejudice. Hey, folks, quick message from our sponsor, Blinkist, which is offering my audience an unprecedented 45% off. Wouldn't you like to be one of those people who seems to know something about, well, pretty much everything? And wouldn't you like not to be the guy who has about two sentences worth of knowledge about everything? So please don't challenge anything I say because all I know is the two sentences. Blinkist can fix that problem for you in no time because it has thousands and thousands of nonfiction titles that it has summarized for you in 15-minute chunks that you can read or listen to. So imagine how many books you can be absorbing on your commute and how quickly you can transform into that person you would love to be. I have been enjoying the many titles in their 14-day personal growth challenge because I do believe in personal growth, but I don't believe in personal growth books because 95% of them are fluff. But I want that 5%. That's what Blinkist gives me. Plus, their great new feature, Blinkist Connect, more or less gives you two subscriptions to Blinkist for the price of one because you can share titles that you find interesting with your friend. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 45% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 45% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. This offer is good through April 30th, 2023 only. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. All right, Robert, I got two more questions for you and you can budget your time however you want. Give short answers if you like. But the first one is, what do you think about this theory that I'm hearing in some circles that the charges against Trump are so obviously flimsy that they are hoping that in fact, It will result in a backlash. It'll make people rally to Trump because this time around, they do want to face Trump in the general. They think he is weaker. So there's this kind of 4D. I personally think that's too clever by half, but there's that 4D chess argument. And the second thing is one of my, I have a supporting listeners group and I asked them for question ideas for you. And one of them said, do you know anything about the case against Trump going on in Georgia? Is there anything more to that one or any background on that? I do love the, 4D chess interpretation of the Trump critics, particularly on the Republican side, that this is a super secret plan to get Trump the nomination. What that assumes is two things. One, nobody wants to be criminally prosecuted, (laughs) period. Nobody wants that risk of jail and prison. You could tell Trump was agitated the whole day he was there. So the idea that this is secretly meant to benefit Trump requires a degree of understanding of criminal prosecutions and these participants that belies the facts. Nobody out there would say, hey, I can probably boost your career by bringing a criminal prosecution against you. And don't worry, it'll all work out in the end. How many people are going to volunteer for that? So just the nature of criminal prosecutions. And then, as you note, the nature of these prosecutors, there's very little chance that they're trying to elevate Trump because they think Trump's the most beatable. Also, I can tell you their own polls show the same things that Richard Barris, the People's Pundit, has polled. Trump still polls stronger than anybody else in the key swing states. So in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Arizona, Nevada, in those places, Georgia's more split. 
But in all those other places, Trump polls better than every other Republican alternative. And they know that because Trump is, as Republicans should have had a wake up call a few days ago, they lost a big Supreme Court race in Wisconsin that now flipped that court back to Democratic majority because Wisconsin, the only Republican they've ever voted for for president since Reagan was named Donald John Trump. They voted for Dukakis. They voted for Clinton. They voted for Gore. They voted for Kerry. That gives you an idea. They voted for Obama twice. Even when Paul Ryan was on the ticket, they voted overwhelmingly for Obama. So states like Wisconsin, Democrats know that only Trump can break through there. Not only that, they saw in 2022, like they saw in 2018, that if Trump's not on the ballot, there's a bunch of working class independent voters that would otherwise vote Republican down ballot that don't turn out unless Trump is on the top of the ticket. So they know that if they can keep Trump off the top of the ticket, that is their best chance to hold the White House and their best chance to take back the House and keep the Senate. They know if Trump's at the top of the ticket, at a minimum, they lose the Senate and lose more seats in the House because that's what happened both in 2016 and 2020. Republican candidates for the House and Senate overperformed because Trump brought out a bunch of voters that nobody else did. So this goes beyond just Trump. They know that Trump on the top of the ticket hurts them for their congressional majority plans. But, oh, remind me, what was your second question? About the case against Trump in Georgia. Oh, it's clear that they want to bring more charges. So my theory was that they chose New York because they realized how weak and politically problematic bringing prosecutions around Mar-a-Lago, bringing around January 6th, or bringing charges in Georgia were. The problems on the federal side is the Biden administration doesn't want to look like they're the ones indicting Trump. So that's the problem with the Mar-a-Lago and classified case from a political perspective. They will bring it in D.C. so they have the same rigged system in terms of juries and judges, but not as much in terms of judges. Those judges are a mixture of Trump appointees and others, so they don't have the same political partisan control they have in New York. And then factually, there's issues. Not only did Trump commit no crimes, either related to January 6th or the Mar-a-Lago raid, but of course, Biden committed real crimes related to classified documents if we're going to suddenly label that a crime. In my view, all of that's exaggerated. We shouldn't be putting anybody in prison because the government wants to overclassify and hide information from us. But putting that aside, if we're going to call it a crime, Biden is the one who's guilty of it, not Trump. So they have factual issues there. But it's clear from the leaks this week to the Washington Post that Jack Smith, the special counsel appointed by the Biden administration, is trying to indict Trump, probably going to come up with obstruction of justice charges rather than classified documents charges to evade the Biden comparison and analogy. So they're trying to do that there. And then in Georgia, the grand jury's already formed, already made its votes. The grand jury foreperson did a tour. And basically, she's an actual former witch or maybe active witch, practicing witch, and she's a complete loon, so much so that Anderson Cooper said, this is embarrassing having this person be the one that was in charge of the Atlanta grand jury. And they could bring a charge there based on the phone call that the settlement mediation phone call involving pending litigation against the then Georgia Secretary of State that never should have been leaked. That's illegal information to be disclosed since it was a settlement call. But independent of that, there was nothing about that call that was illegal anyway. So they have to make up a crime there, too. And they have the additional problems. Not only do they have no facts to support the allegations, but the Georgia governor, Brian Kemp, is Republican. The Georgia state legislature is Republican. They could potentially, in various ways, use their political power to shut down that case. So I think that's why they chose New York, is New York was the place they had the most political control. And they thought the most scandalous facts. Oh, you know, it's Stormy Daniels. It's a porn star. It's adultery. It's personally embarrassing. Uh, Not realizing that's always been baked into the cake about people's popular perception of Trump going back many, many decades. I mean, ever since he divorced Ivanka, you know, he was known as a playboy before that. So none of that was ever going to stick politically. It could hurt him personally, but not politically. The Georgia and D.C. cases are bogus, but that doesn't mean that they won't use the New York case as the reason to march forward anyway, saying, well, now we've crossed the Rubicon. So let's keep marching forward and damaging the constitutional republic with more bogus charges. That's unbelievable. This is really demoralizing. I mean, I'd like to leave on a happy note or an encouraging note. Have you got one? Yeah. So Michael Malice has got his book out, The White Pill. The white pill in this is that there have been political weaponization of our criminal justice process since the founding of the country. Samuel Chase was involved in an initial impeachment as a Supreme Court justice because as a trial court judge, he tried to go after his political adversaries. So this is unfortunately not new. What's new is the public backlash. 
What's new is somebody like Trump not capitulating to the system. That's what's new. What's new is not the overt, open political weaponization of our system. Now, elevating it to a former president is new. Doing it to a leading presidential opponent is new, but not to any presidential opponent because they did it to Eugene V. Depps during World War I for opposing the draft and for getting a lot of votes in the 1912 election. They put him in a federal prison. So what's encouraging is that for those of us that have been on the front lines of these politically motivated cases for decades, we're finally getting mass public support and support from a former president of the United States and the leading opponent, leading candidate to be the next president of the United States. So to me, the world seeing that the emperor has no clothes, that seeing behind the curtain to how politically naked the weaponization of our criminal justice process has been is a massive white pill because what's always been needed to get to real reform is to see the ugliness of the situation in all of its reality. I do agree on that. I do think that people have a schoolhouse rock view of how the legal system works. And I think they have no idea what's actually taking place. And if this doesn't make it obvious, then nothing will. Now, I want to urge people, after you've heard this episode, obviously you want to hear more Robert Barnes. And obviously you want to get more of his content. So I want to strongly urge you join their locals. And the website is vivabarnslaw.locals.com. I'll have it linked at tomwoods.com slash 2312. But again, it's vivabarnslaw.locals.com. That's where a lot of people who are going to be very sympathetic to you and who want to see through the headlines and find out what's really going on can be found and where they gather. So again, I cannot urge you enough. VivaBarnesLaw.Locals.com and get not only Robert Barnes, but our other friend, Viva Fry. You'll find him there too. Robert, thanks so much for doing this. I know you must be insanely busy. Just when you think you couldn't be any more busy, they indict the former president of the United States. <laughs> exactly. All right. Thanks a lot, man. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. All right, folks. I have a couple of very interesting items for you before we wrap up. April 19th is the world premiere of the documentary series called Follow the Science, Lockdowns Go Viral. You'll remember I had one of the creators of that documentary on the program and the team putting it together, most of them are doing so anonymously. They have excellent reputations as filmmakers. They believe in telling the real story about what happened with COVID, but of course they know what's going to happen to them in terms of their careers if they're open about this. So we have the quality of an outstanding professional documentary, but without the names being made public. But anyway, it's a fantastic series. And the first installment of it is having its world premiere in Orlando, April 19th. So please spread the word about that. Bring your friends, but get the details and sign up. It doesn't cost anything to attend, but they'd like to get the sense of the numbers because they are having it at an ordinary movie theater. I think it's a Regal Cinemas somewhere in Orlando, get the details at tomwoods.com slash documentary. The second thing I want to tell you about is the very next day in New York City. So if you're a real jet setter, you can go to that documentary, then hop on a plane, head up to New York City and support our friend Gene Epstein, whose Soho Forum is a wonderful debate series in New York that takes on important issues and sheds more light than heat. And this particular one has the following resolution. The New York Times book, The 1619 Project, and the Hulu video series based on it are important contributions to our understanding of slavery and the role of African Americans in American history. Arguing for the affirmative is historian Woody Holton, and arguing for the negative is senior research faculty and director of research and education at the American Institute for Economic Research, Phil Magnus. So get the details on attending at thesohoforum.org. That's thesohoforum.org. Thanks for listening, everybody. See you next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.